So I would like to invite Ambassador Sasai, please, for the opening remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am president of JIA. My name is Sasai. Well, although I say that, uh, since uh, this week, I have been serving as president of JIA, and so I'm uh, still a novice. Uh, I'm uh, brand new as uh, a president, and uh, uh, this symposium is titled Looking Back at Asia in the 20th Century uh, from the Perspectives of International Relations and State Building. And as for this symposium, just two days ago, I was told that uh, uh, about the nature of the symposium, you know, and I thought uh, this was a, a great uh, symposium. I don't want to praise uh, ourselves for what we are doing, but I was very surprised. And I thought that uh, I have been looking forward to this symposium. And so once again, I would like to, to uh, thank the panelists, uh, not just panelists, but uh, also uh, the general public uh, who are taking part uh, in this symposium for your participation. At uh, the JIA, uh, uh, since fiscal 2016, we have uh, begun a three-year program. Uh, we have uh, received uh, the uh, subsidy for research funds, and the title of the project is the Transnational Joint Research on the History of Asia in the 20th Century, an attempt for a parallel history. So we have been carrying out this research project. And this research project is uh, guided by Professor Akihito Tanaka, who is uh, president of uh, Graduate Research Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS for short. And uh, we have had the participation of uh, many researchers uh, who are uh, uh, at the forefront of uh, research, about uh, 25 of them, and uh, uh, have been carrying out uh, this uh, project. And uh, this project is uh, to really look at uh, the uh, state building and international relations, uh, not just uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, the country is concerned, but uh, uh, also from the Asian perspective and also global perspective uh, to see uh, how the uh, history in the 20th century developed. It has been 70 years since the end of World War II. So what uh, has been the history I believe uh, uh, we still have see uh, quite a great significance in the history. So how can we base ourselves on facts and look at history from an uh, uh, objective perspective? This seems easy, but in fact it is very difficult. Now, insofar as I'm concerned, uh, I have been uh, working for the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, uh, we have had uh, uh, issues concerning the Asia or the uh, legacy of history uh, in uh, Chinese terms. And uh, the uh, inter-country relationship or nationalism of Asia. When we consider these issues, what was it? Uh, what happened? Uh, that is something that we need to look at uh, uh, from the objective uh, uh, viewpoint and uh, understand the facts. Uh, well, when we say what was the history, we tend to, uh, there are uh, well, uh, many cases where there are uh, well, uh, conflicts about the history uh, in Asia. And uh, uh, with respect to Japan, uh, Korea, or Japan, China, uh, history joint work research on behalf of the government, I was uh, sitting on the sidelines and uh, looking at the uh, efforts. What well, was facts? Uh, it is very difficult to start from that, but uh, without that, how did things happen? And uh, from the 
the value uh, in terms of uh, the present times? What happened? Uh, what was the significance in considering uh, this? We wouldn't have any basis for that, and so more uh, objective and uh, the um, academic uh, uh, look at it is very important, and uh, not just uh, uh, mutual understanding among academicians or not just uh, uh, mutual exchanging among academicians, but uh, I think the results of the uh, research uh, uh, sh uh, should be uh, shared among uh, many nations, and that would be uh, quite significant. And the final result of this effort will be uh, published uh, so that uh, broadly people in the world uh, would be able to have a shared understanding. So today's symposium is to uh, report to you just parts of the result of the research. Each and every one of the panelists, I will not introduce them to you, but uh, we have uh, outstanding, renowned researchers, uh, scholars, who are participating in this symposium. And uh, I sincerely hope that we'll have a very active discussions. And also, uh, people on the floor, we would like to uh, ask you to uh, air your views as well as questions uh, uh, without hesitation. When it comes to academic research, Of course, it is uh, important to do that in uh, uh, well, academic uh, forums, but uh, I think it is important for such a discussion uh, to uh, withstand uh, public debate. And so in this respect, people on the floor, uh, from that perspective, uh, are urged to participate in the symposium and uh, make a contribution. Again, uh, thank you so much for your participation today. And also, uh, we have... Uh, uh, ambassadors and other people from the uh, diplomatic corps uh, who are here. And so uh, please enjoy today's discussion. Thank you. Next. The leader of this project, uh, Professor Akihiko Tanakaku, uh, president of uh, GRIPS, the uh, uh, Graduate Research Institute for Policy Studies uh, to uh, explain to us uh, uh, the uh, purpose uh, and the gist of this uh, project. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Akihiko Tanaka uh, with uh, GRIPS. I have been heading up uh, this uh, uh, project uh, uh, for this research, and uh, I would like to talk uh, uh, a bit about uh, the uh, purpose of the project. Now, as was mentioned by uh, President Sasai, in, in July 2016, this uh, project uh, was launched, and the we would like to look back at uh, uh, Asia in the 20th century. We, this is a very ambitious project to uh, really look at the history. Uh, well, with respect to the Asian history in the 20th century, for uh, decades, we have had accumulation of uh, researches. Despite that, uh, now, once again, we are trying to study the uh, history of Asia in the 20th century, and uh, we have been embarked upon this uh, project. And uh, the among the participants in the project, uh, we have had many meetings, uh, and uh, we have uh, already most, more or less finalized the uh, chapters. And uh, for many chapters, we now have a draft text. And so in this, uh, today's symposium, uh, we would like to uh, uh, share with you uh, some of our research uh, outcomes for discussion. Specifically, uh, with respect to the issue that we have been tackling in this project, in uh, March uh, last year, we had an open symposium, and I said about this, and uh, for uh, people who are participating in today's uh, uh, symposium, there are many who did not participate in last year's symposium. So I may have to repeat myself, but I would like to uh, talk just a little bit about that, uh, uh, about that symposium. Now, 
fundamental point is uh, right now we are in the 21st century and looking at from now the history in the 20th century should be perhaps rewritten at least uh, from the perspective of us in the 21st century uh, the what is the history of uh, 20th century that uh, would be convincing what is it uh, that is the issue that uh, we try to tackle now, why did we have uh, uh, this issue? Now, if you look at Asia, particularly East Asia uh, right now, the, during the 20th century, we just uh, took uh, granted uh, the kind of Asia, but uh, the Asia that we see is quite different from it. For example, in 1970, the, in the world, Asia, what uh, uh, was the region uh, uh, like? Uh, simply put, uh, Asia uh, had uh, frequent international conflicts in the world, and this was also uh, well uh, backward uh, in terms of economy, in terms of pro capita GDP in most of the uh, Asia sub, uh, compared with the sub-Saharan Africa. It was lower. Also, uh, the only Japan was the advanced country back then. But uh, now, uh, what is Asia in the 21st century, particularly East Asia? Right now, East Asia is, relatively speaking, uh, peaceful. Uh, specifically, in 1979, there was a China-Vietnam war. Since then, there has not been major uh, interstate war. And also, in 1991, uh, Paris uh, Accord uh, took place, uh, ending the uh, Cambodian uh, the, uh, uh, war. There has not been any uh, civil war since then. And also, in uh, addition to peace, there is a tremendous uh, Prosperity, not just Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, all these uh, regions, no matter uh, how you look at them, uh, they are enjoying the uh, uh, highest uh, uh, the uh, living standards. And also other countries, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, the economic uh, uh, growth curve is high. Of course, in terms of uh, per capita uh, GDP, there are countries that hasn't reached uh, $10,000, but uh, they are certainly growing rapidly as a result of these. Now, in the uh, global economy, the uh, share of uh, the Asian uh, economy is uh, growing. Uh, it is well known, the Angus Madison uh, economist, uh, well, the uh, economic history scholar, according to him. In 1920, China, India, the, their uh, GDP accounted for uh, more than 50%. But now, in, from the 19th century to the mid-20th century, the Western countries and the U.S., the Western countries' share increased dramatically. Asia's share uh, dropped uh, quite precipitously. And uh, from the second half of the 20th century, that uh, started to change. In the 1970, Asia was the poorest uh, region in the world. But uh, in the 21st century, in mid-21st century, the Asian share will once again uh, would be on a par to 2090, about 50 percent of the uh, and 100 percent uh, global share. Uh, now, in the past, uh, uh, the industrial uh, revolution took place, and since then, uh, if you look at the global history, the uh, uh, economic uh, uh, well, uh, power of the Western countries uh, uh, overwhelmed the rest of the world. Why? That was the perspective. But now, the uh, overwhelming position of the Western country is such an age is uh, now coming to an end. If this is true, then the, if you look at the world history and the Asian history, in terms of uh, description, why has uh, the uh, overwhelming victory of uh, Western countries ended? Why is the a share of Asia increasing? Uh, well, uh, is it uh, coming back to the uh, 19th century pattern? We have to rewrite uh, the history of Asia as well as the world. Now, in terms of international relations, we have peace and also the prosperity in economics. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, politics in addition in Asia or in East Asia particularly, I think there are some features, characteristics. Number one, the political regime of uh, Asia, East Asia is uh, diverse. Another point is in East Asia, the uh, collapsed uh, or failed nations, these uh, uh, fragile nations do not exist. In East Asia, the as a result of economic growth, the uh, living standard has become uh, higher. Uh, it is getting higher. In terms of political regime, the, uh, there is uh, free democracy and also there is authoritarian regime uh, of uh, uh, the uh, authoritarianism. And also there are countries that uh, may be positioned in between. 
of course, the kind of uh, situation in East Asia, how is it stable? How stable is it? Uh, maybe different people may have different views. Uh, those people who uh, uh, say peace, uh, peace is uh, in East Asia, is it really a peace? We have uh, uh, issue of uh, North Korea. So it, there is a possibility that this stability is quite unstable in terms of prosperity. In this uh, economic growth, how is it stable? Uh, there may be a room for uh, discussion. In the case of developing countries, as is often said, the, uh, there is a middle income trap. Uh, that is an issue. Uh, we may be afflicted uh, uh, by the middle income trap, and that may be a concern. However, the premise of the 20th century was poor Asia how could it uh, develop themselves, this perspective, uh, as opposed to the relatively uh, peace and relatively uh, uh, highly economic uh, growing Asia. From this perspective, if you look uh, back uh, at the uh, 20th century, the, uh, there should be changes to the description of history. And here, the, we have a diverse uh, political regime in East Asia. Still, uh, economic growth is happening in many parts of East Asia. Why? This is something that merits our deeper thinking. In the past, in Western countries, the typical uh, uh, view of Asia, what was uh, Asia like? The uh, most uh, uh, classical view is uh, Asian uh, in pro model of production. Uh, of uh, Marxism. That was a typical view. That says uh, Asia, uh, under the uh, typical uh, the uh, uh, imperial uh, order, uh, the uh, um, stagnation will continue. But then there would be there was uh, more uh, imperial countries, and uh, the uh, uh, Marxism included uh, the Leninism and uh, Maoism. But uh, the Asia uh, trying to free itself from uh, imperialism uh, became larger. And also, uh, after the official independence, uh, there are many countries that uh, were, uh, were poverty-stricken, and uh, the uh, dependency and also neo-colonialism were the views to look at uh, the history of Asia. Now, against this backdrop, Japan was uh, exceptionally, and uh, Japan only was uh, uh, growing rapidly. Why was Japan able to do so? And this issue uh, drew a lot of attention. Uh, unlike in, uh, any other country, uh, Japan uh, well, the, uh, uh, had an uh, environment where the Western uh, development uh, concept was applied to. But uh, from the 1970 uh, to the uh, 21st century, we know th uh, the development. Why did uh, Western countries develop? Or why was Japan an exception? Uh, why uh, Japan only uh, developed itself? But this is not uh, uh, well true. Uh, this is contrary to the uh, facts. The political regime was a democracy uh, uh, that entails a growth, uh, but that doesn't uh, hold true to East Asia. Uh, other countries than Japan. And also, uh, if he, the country is not uh, democratic, uh, uh, there was an uh, economic growth. So why is this the case? We have to, uh, well, uh, so what happened in the 20th century? Uh, with, uh, uh, well, uh, otherwise, uh, the uh, reality of the Asia in 21st century would not be understood. And uh, also, uh, the Japan and the US are not, uh, the uh, Western countries are not exceptions. If this is true, then uh, in, if you look at the history of the Asia, maybe there are universal facts that can be gleaned from, uh, from it. And uh, this may be uh, useful for the development of other uh, regions in the world. And uh, Western countries, Japan and uh, Asia, for these countries, through the study of uh, the history of 20th century, from the, uh, there may be a lot of lessons learned uh, that may be universal. And uh, in this project, uh, the approach is uh, to uh, look at uh, the history of Asia in the 21st century from the perspective of international relations and also the uh, uh, 
the history of our states. Uh, we are going to have chapters around this. And in the first, uh, in the morning, uh, we are going to have a discussion around the international relations chapter. In the afternoon, we are going to have a discussion about the history of uh, different countries. Why uh, did we structure this uh, symposium? Uh, there is uh, some uh, theoretical background, and uh, I would like to explain this a little. And that is, as I said before, in East Asia, the, we have peace and prosperity. And here, uh, one of the conditions for this was in this region, at this uh, point in time, the regimes may differ, but uh, state well, states are stable, relatively speaking. Uh, there is no fragile uh, states or failed states. Uh, there is uh, more or less uh, no such state in this region. And that is something that we need to pay attention to. And uh, as a result, uh, we came up with these uh, chapters. If a state is uh, stable, what is it? Uh, broadly speaking, external uh, order or the uh, uh, equilibrium is uh, maintained, and also internal equilibrium is uh, maintained. So the both external and internal equilibrium uh, is maintained. If uh, this is, is done, then uh, that leads to the stability of the state. The external equilibrium, that is, in the international relations, states uh, main, can maintain sovereignty. Uh, the capability is held by the country. However, uh, ex when it comes to external equilibrium, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, dependent on the international relations. If, if the international relations are peaceful, uh, the harmonious, and if there is no uh, use of arms in the international relations, then uh, the stability, uh, the uh, equ external equilibrium does not uh, require any uh, uh, arsenals. But if there is a conflict and uh, violent uh, ridden, and if there is un not the harmony in the international relations, then uh, unless uh, there is a, a very strong uh, capability in the country, uh, there can be no uh, external equilibrium that can be maintained. So, uh, in uh, such a very difficult international relations, the, in, uh, the countries that may not have uh, internal capabilities, uh, as was seen in the early 20th century, they might become uh, colonies or they become uh, semi-dependencies. So, how should we have, uh, uh, well, capabilities? And that has to do with uh, uh, external equilibrium. On the other hand, when it comes to the, even if external aspects are resolved, the uh, country uh, state uh, has to have some uh, internal equilibria. Uh, the first point is the society. In connection with the society, the state uh, has to have uh, a governing capability. Otherwise, the, uh, there might be a civil war in the state. Uh, if there is a, a, well, f a lot of uh, violence, how can the state control it? Uh, there might be uh, uh, internal conflicts, and uh, if there are multiple ethnic groups, and if you cannot uh, unify them, then the state, uh, in connection with the society, cannot maintain equilibrium. Also, another point is that uh, the uh, state uh, has to uh, maintain equilibrium with respect to the economy, otherwise the uh, state might uh, collapse. Uh, if you cannot use uh, a market well, uh, or in other words, if you can use a market well, then the, uh, uh, you can uh, better uh, run the uh, uh, governance. And also the uh, state, whether it can control itself well or not. The self-control mechanism, uh, whether uh, such a capability is owned by the state, that is also another important point. For example, if the state uh, the, uh, selects a certain ruler, and if this ruler run amok, how can you check this uh, ruler? Uh, for the state, uh, this is an immensely important function. If there is an autocrat, and uh, if the autocrat uh, is uh, doing a good uh, governance, uh, uh, that's well. But uh, if uh, this person runs amok, uh, what would happen? If some parts of the organizations, like uh, military, if uh, it runs amok, then how can the state uh, control it? This again is uh, has is uh, a decisive factor for the stability of the state. 
In other words, internal equilibrium, uh, the relationship with the society, relationship with the market, and also relationship with itself, these are uh, the decisive factors. And unless there is a stability, uh, the uh, state cannot be stable. If uh, they can't uh, maintain the stable, it becomes a failure state. If they can't uh, uh, control the external uh, equilibrium, then there cannot be internal equilibrium, and that may entail becoming a, a colony. If this uh, all goes well, there is a, a virtual cycle. The equi uh, internal equilibrium uh, entails uh, external equilibrium. If the international re uh, relationship is peaceful and harmonious, and depending on the uh, movement in the international relations uh, between superpowers, the competitive uh, situation uh, even if uh, the, uh, uh, there is a weak uh, uh, capability in terms of uh, internal equilibrium, uh, this uh, state uh, may find itself uh, uh, able to run, the, uh, run itself well. So I have been rather abstract, but in the ensuing discussions in the morning, uh, we are going to discuss international relations. The international relations in the 20th century, how did it develop? And uh, in each country in the 20th century, what kind of international relations were provided? Uh, we would like to uh, uh, illustrate that. And also in the afternoon session, each country, each state, in the international relations, uh, there were uh, various developments. We call them critical junctures or decisive uh, events. And in other words, external equilibrium and the internal equilibrium may be uh, wavered, impacted uh, by these events, and how would the state uh, respond to that? And depending on that, uh, the, the stability of the nation state uh, may uh, differ, and I would like to specifically elucidate these points. Well, I be, uh, tended to be rather abstract in the second half of my remarks, but uh, when it comes to specifics, uh, we would like to uh, further study these aspects in the panel discussions. I have been a bit lengthy. Uh, with that, I would like to conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Tanaka. Now, we start part one of this symposium, East Asia and International Relations in the 20th Century. Moderator is Professor Tanaka, President of GRIPS. And Professor Kawashima, Professor Kitaoka, and Professor Asano, and Professor Takahara. Four of you, please come forward. Uh, Professor Kawashima is there from the University of Tokyo, and Professor Kitaoka, President of JICA, and the Professor Asano, Awaseda University, and Professor Takahara is the, uh, from the University of Tokyo. Now, we would like, to, we would like to start the first panel discussion. As I said beforehand, in the first part, we will talk about the East Asia and international relations in the 20th century. That is uh, the perspective. And according to the symposium, uh, Professor Kawashima is the one who's going to start. But in terms of chronological order, we change the order of the speakers. So we first ask a, a Professor Kitaoka, President of JICA, to talk about the East Asia in the, 20, in the early 20th century, followed by a Professor Kawashima's report. Then, after that, the Professor Asano and Professor Takahara uh, will join in the panel discussion. Uh, Professor Kitaoka, please. So I have a three-page handout or so in front of you, and uh, it is uh, rather roughly written. And for example, the name of the symposium is erroneous because uh, this is from the old version. We've changed the naming a number of times, and uh, I'm looking at the 
nine, well, what it says 1930, 1900 to 1930, and uh, from 1900 to 1930 is my role in this uh, 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 publication. So that's why the uh, title is erroneous, but. Um, uh, as far as the overview of the symposium is concerned, that is looking at the international relations in the 20th century in, uh, in Asia, uh, I want to organize my thoughts. Uh, 1900 is when the Boxer Rebellion occurred. The Boxer Rebellion, in from the viewpoint of uh, historians looking at uh, foreign uh, affairs, it's quite symbolic, that is. With uh, the Western powers, uh, Japan fought with China, the Qin Dynasty. And uh, it was uh, uh, very symbolic that uh, Japan was on the side of the West, although uh, looking from the viewpoint of China, uh, Boxer Rebellion was uh, rather irrational, and uh, it was doomed to fail, and so before that, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, another incident, and uh, uh, the regime uh, cannot uh, uh, get by. That uh, became established, and uh, in the end of the Edo period, it has the similar meaning to Japan, feeling that uh, it could not get by uh, with in this uh, world with the West. And so, uh, if you look at the 1900 as one uh, basic uh, timing point that is going to be quite uh, interesting. And uh, then uh, there is uh, the second uh, note, uh, open door note, that comes out in 1900. And as you know, uh, this is uh, open door and equal opportunity to create a, a sphere of influence in China, although there are uh, powers already there, there should no, be no discrimination as to the other powers. That was you could say, uh, U.S. trying to get into the picture. And then this uh, second open door note says something more important, that is territorial administrative integrity. That is, this has to do with this integrity of uh, the territory and administration. It should not uh, be um, ups uh, damaged. And uh, I think this is very important. And that is, in China, it should not be divided further, and uh, there has to be the administrative integration, for example, uh, the railroad by a certain country or uh, postal service by another country. In other words, uh, there should be no division of such administration, is what they were saying. And uh, to go uh, further, uh, in China now, when you lend money and uh, you cannot repay it. Uh, there is, for example, uh, trying to uh, control the jurisdiction of a certain port. Uh, that kind of thing should be prohibited. And uh, I think uh, that is quite interested. interesting. Now, in 1900, as of that time, if we look at East Asia, what is important is compared to today, uh, the uh, territory has not uh, really uh, changed. In other words, there was the fixing of the territory, for example, Myanmar. It was uh, one a part of the British uh, uh, Indies. And uh, also the uh, uh, border had not changed. Thai is, has not lost this border. And Malaysia, you have the British Malaya. And if you compare to a little while ago, you have uh, the UK coming in basically for trade, and that is, they wanted the port cities for trade. But uh, up until 1900, in terms, they also tried the territorial expansion, and the trigger being rubber plantation. And that means that uh, uh, if you want to have a plantation, then you have to expand in a plainer term. And uh, so uh, Chinese people would come in, 
to the Union of uh, uh, Malaysia, so the British Malaya changed. And as you know today, Malaysia has a number of sultanates, and you could say that uh, in a sense uh, they are one country but also uh, made up of these, uh, this Union of Sultanates. And you could say that maybe was uh, due to the uh, British rule. And you have uh, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and uh, no, these are separate countries now, but that was the French uh, Indochina. And then uh, uh, if you look at the outer boundary, it has not changed that much. And then you have Indonesia. If you go back, uh, well, you have uh, opium more making China weak. And uh, so the Chinese civilization in the south, well, there was advance to the south after the uh, Sino-French War. And so Indonesia too, Netherlands had territory and uh, they uh, broadened uh, their territory. Philippines at the end of uh, 19th century uh, became uh, US territory, Taiwan, uh, Japan. And so in this way, We talk about uh, uh, the territory, uh, sovereign right, and people. And in terms of territory, I think it was around 1900 that this became uh, pretty much fixed. And if you go back 20 or 30 years uh, from then, it was rather fluid. But in 1900, the territory was more or less fixed. That means that uh, there are less conflicts uh, in terms of that kind of uh, uh, territorial borders. And uh, in Southeast Asia, as a result of colonial management, what happens? Well, to a certain extent, uh, education will be improved and you have uh, elementary education so that you can unify language. And in higher education, it is possible to educate elites. And then uh, it's true for France, uh, for example. Uh, if you educate elites, then always uh, it does not necessarily mean you are um, uh, uh, loyal to the uh, suzerain, and there's always uh, some uh, resentment, and uh, uh, that could lead to uh, nationalistic feelings and uh, movements of independence. Another thing is that uh, the suzerain, in order to get profit, will try to promote industry, for example, rice in Indochina, uh, and uh, not uh, just to be used by themselves. They want to have large production so that it can be used elsewhere. For example, rubber in Malaya is the same. And Myanmar, Burma, rice, uh, for supporting India, they wanted more production. So you have this kind of industrialization occurring too. Another thing is that a government structure needs to be established. A minority uh, people are trying to rule a majority people, so you need to have a structure. And uh, this uh, government structure, well, if it is by the people of that country, then there's a sovereign right. But uh, if you have the structure, but the top people are English or, or French, then there's no uh, sovereign right. But still, if you, there are uh, countries all over the world now that may have sovereign rights, but the structure is rather uh, shaky. So the fact that uh, you have this kind of uh, organizational structure is a result of uh, well, in hindsight, and perhaps one a positive aspect of uh, colonial uh, management. And also, in, with regard to 1900, if we take a look, up until that time, um, decades before that, what hap did not happen occurs. That is, one thing is uh, Japan, an Asian country, becomes an imperial power. And also, uh, there is uh, uh, America that uh, said they were anti-imperialistic, but they become imperialistic, and uh, they have this uh, open-door note to other countries, and they assert themselves. And uh, then, well, Germany may be not so important. Uh, they were not so uh, uh, present in Southeast Asia, but they also uh, come uh, to Asia. And so these Asian country started to set up colonies. At that time, Japan already had Taiwan. And the U.S. starts to become imperialistic, which is very interesting. And that, you could say, 
in, if we focus on a colony in, in colonization in 1900 is a characteristic. And the next impact that occurs a few years later is the Russo-Japanese War. And the, this is where you have a non-Western country uh, ha having big victory over a Western country, which had a major impact. And uh, Japan... Um, well, uh, played well against uh, Belgium, and soccer fans are very excited. Uh, but that, uh, if you compare, uh, it is uh, even more of an uh, impact here. And uh, so pre-war Japan was uh, like that. There was a big uh, impact, big shock. And for example, Nehru of India, you don't think he's so pro-Japanese, but uh, he was very inspired, uh, received a big uh, shock. And as a result, uh, that could lead to the uh, independence movement. Uh, we can do it too, sort of. And uh, in Vietnam, you have the Tong Yu uh, movement. And uh, in Vietnam, um, well, uh, it is related to this, and also the nationalism in uh, Xin Dynasty China. And target is uh, Japan, naturally. Japan has, it starts to become uh, this uh, newest imperial power. And uh, so the uh, target of uh, uh, Xin uh, China would be to block the Manchurian uh, management uh, by Japan. And uh, one another thing, Im interesting thing that happened is that uh, well, Manchuria is where the, the Qin uh, is starting, and um, the Qin dynasty uh, starts to put uh, people in there, and the Han uh, people come in, and then with Manchuria and the uh, uh, Qin dynasty, uh, with the inflow of the Han people, it uh, becomes the Han uh, kind of uh, area. So that is a unification, so to speak. And Japan it did inspire movements of independence of the colonies, but Japan could not side with the colonies because, uh, financially speaking, it was impossible as a result of the Russo-Japanese War. Well, for Japan, the financial burden uh, afterwards had a very big influence. And uh, as a Japan expert, uh, that's how I think. That is, there is a dependence uh, to the U.S.-British capital, uh, which was of a very big amount. It was insufficient. Uh, Japan also borrowed from France, uh, borrowed from uh, U.K., and at the uh, low interest, they uh, had to refinance because uh, there was red ink in terms of trade at that time. And uh, how do you repay that? Uh, well, you compromise uh, with the uh, U.K. And what did the U.K. require? That uh, Japan does not uh, uh, support uh, the uh, independence movements in India and Vietnam. And also France, in 1908, uh, there is the um, Japan-French uh, agreement, and um, at the time, uh, money had been lent, and the condition is that uh, Vietnamese uh, independence movement would not be supported. And the U.S., too, uh, maybe not so uh, blunt, but uh, uh, there is the Katra Taft agreement, and uh, uh, again, uh, the independence movement in Philippines uh, could not be supported. And so, uh, after the Boxer Rebellion, uh, Japan you, was requested to join the Western side and leave uh, the Asian side. Now, uh, for example, uh, when there was the uh, Japan-French uh, uh, agreement, it was about uh, not uh, entering Vietnam or not uh, supporting independence movements in Indochina. And after that, too, however, there is a big incident that is the World War I. And uh, World War I was a major incident. And uh, again, uh, there were various interesting things that occurred. For example, in Thailand, uh, rather uh, smart, they looked at who would win. And it seemed that. Well, the U.S. also participated, and uh, so uh, they uh, side with the uh, winners and uh, used that situation to try to uh, revise the unequal tre treaty, which I think is uh, quite smart. And uh, France, uh, it's often known that uh, they used the African soldiers, and uh, the weakness of the French side is the number of people and labor shortage. And so... Uh, from uh, the Indochina, uh, there is uh, cooperation to the war, and uh, 
war, it said promote the democratization because uh, people's lives are equal and therefore discrimination uh, is weakened. And uh, uh, for example, uh, in Japan too, you could be very rich or you could be one worker, but uh, you are equal on the battlefield. And in the same way, uh, for the French in the China, they go to France and Europe and they participate in war or they support the uh, back uh, 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 logistics. And uh, then uh, they go to France and they see that, uh, well, what is so special about the French? And then you have uh, the influence of uh, communism coming in. And so in that sense, uh, World War I had a big uh, opportunity for uh, the um, independence movement and uh, uh, Burma. Uh, well, in UK, there was India and others, uh, lots of people in India. And the uh, Philippines, uh, rather less influence uh, because the U.S. was uh, uh, neutral for a long time. And Japan, well, there was the 21 demands. And uh, you could say that was uh, making use of a disaster. But uh, even without using such power, the, well, there is a vacancy of uh, Western uh, power. And then uh, so Japanese uh, products could come in to fill the gap. and. Also uh, in the uh, marine transport area too, and also uh, U.S. Uh, too becomes a very a strong presence, and uh, especially in terms of uh, ideology, uh, for example, self determination, uh, leading to three one uh, or uh, influencing three one movements and five four movements, and uh, Japan. Uh, economic uh, power maybe became pervasive, but the U.S. Uh, ideology or philosophy uh, becomes uh, pervasive in uh, Asia, too. And in the 1920s, uh, the, uh, there is an insufficient uh, balance that is maintained, and then you have party politics and international cooperation, uh, notice in Japan, and uh, the uh, development uh, through economy. Without uh, a military power, you can use economy. And the uh, hierarchy cabinet um, focused on uh, party politics. And without uh, military power, Japan could continue to prosper economically. And that was the idea. And uh, the, the America on the other side was seen. And uh, it, America was the rising star and uh, model for the world. That is, uh, there was the model of democracy. And democracy, by the way, uh, up until World War I was not uh, necessarily a good word. Empire was the word used. Habsburgs, ha Romanovs, and Orangeworths, uh, the three um, families uh, collapsed. And so uh, democracy came uh, up after World War II and there's, uh, World I, sorry, and then there's uh, movies, sports, and jazz. And uh, in that sense, uh, this is American culture that became more pervasive. And uh, that being the case among the major countries, uh, the tension uh, became stabilized through disarmament. But it was not the sufficient stability and uh, as you know, you could say that uh, there was the failed uh, Pax Americana um, in Asia at that time. And uh, the trigger to that was the Great Depression. And uh, now going to the second uh, part of my talk, uh, uh, but even uh, other than that, in terms of the stability of East Asia, there was a condition that uh, uh, the uh, colonization or imperialization is not going to be further strengthened, but you wanted to maintain the status quo, and that was the agreement among the imperialistic powers. And uh, with, there is the um, nine country uh, treaty uh, for or the China nine party treaty, and uh, the uh, um, uh, and. Um, uh, in certain areas, China wanted to regain, uh, recover uh, their interests. And there was a movement uh, to that extent. And then uh, Russia, USSR was outside that framework, and also Germany. Uh, Germany uh, lost in the war. And uh, the USSR, uh, they have their ideology and their materialistic or monetary uh, assistance 
that is uh, the United Front and uh, supported by the United Front. And then you have uh, the Washington uh, regime, uh, U.S., the U.K., and uh, while they didn't support the Beijing government uh, very much, there was uh, confusion and uh, while well, they did not uh, support uh, so much financially, uh, so that the Washington s s structure outside uh, that framework, there is USSR and also the KMT. And uh, the uh, uh, you have uh, the um, Northern Expedition, which uh, challenged this, and uh, then there's the block economy. And uh, South Sea State, uh, naturally, you have the UK uh, and the uh, Dutch and uh, France uh, influence, and then uh, Japan was also having an export drive. So that uh, economically speaking, the stability through the development of the economy becomes more difficult at this time. And at that time, the situation in Japan, if you focus on that situation, as uh, Professor Tanaka mentioned at the outset, uh, the uh, restraint by one country or or uh, the checking function to uh, check uh, the uh, expansion of certain forces was not present in Japan. And you had uh, a Meiji uh, constitution with the symbol of uh, the emperor. And uh, for the first uh, uh, decades of the Meiji era, um, there was a big uh, change. And uh, uh, well, the Satsuma and the Choshu clan are abolished uh, in the beginning of Meiji, and so you get rid of the uh, samurai system because you have the emperor and you have this uh, major reform, but the symbol of the emperor had remained. And uh, who is going to use the symbol then? Well, uh, you have uh, a certain uh, vacuum, and Japan could not uh, act rationally, and there are a number of uh, el elements which intermingled at the same time. If it was just one or two elements, I think Japan could have uh, endured. But uh, there was uh, USSR influence, the fragility of uh, Japan, and uh, four factors. If it was just two uh, factors, uh, there could have, you could have endured, uh, perhaps. And then you come to the war, and I could stop here, but uh, I want to use two or three more minutes. And uh, regardless of the war, you have... Uh, well, Japan lost in the war. Um, Japan expanded and then it lost. But uh, despite that, uh, what happened, the trend up until that time had actually continued. That is, you have uh, the um, UK, uh, France, uh, Netherlands imperialism uh, from the 1940s to the 1950s, it collapsed. And uh, people of South Sea Asia, they thought that uh, these countries were very powerful, but the military uh, were defeated. Uh, and uh, they have, they see experiences of independence, which leads to the independence movements in uh, Southeast Asia. And there's also the uh, flow of money, for example, reparations of Japan. And then after that, uh, ODA by Japan, from Japan to the Southeast Asian nations. And uh, I think that uh, leads to uh, much of, or becomes the basis of much of the development of East Asia after that time. And there's also the Vietnam War. But uh, uh, on this side of the war, well, the, then the uh, Vietnam War, uh, and um, there's also the Korean War, and uh, the uh, economic aspect becomes emphasized again. And at the end, uh, I would like to say that uh, post-war, the colonies uh, become independent, and uh, developmental dictatorship uh, comes out, and uh, then uh, the Cold War ends and the regional integration promoted and then China arises and then now they have uh, one belt, one road, uh, also uh, open in the uh, Pacific uh, ideas. Uh, so China is expanding. What's going to happen uh, going forward? We don't know. Uh, but uh, there are a number of possibilities. And uh, uh, still remaining is in the 19th century when the great powers came in, you have the sovereign state model, the the sovereign state is the basic element of the world. You have territory and uh, you have equal states and you have uh, international law creating rules and these were tools. And 
you could say that it was the Westphalia system in a broad sense of the world, and uh, the East Asia had to change to respond. But now, uh, with China expanding, uh, sovereign state, uh, uh, the rise of sovereign state, and the resolving of conflicts, uh, uh, is uh, can the system um, be maintained? Uh, Intellectually speaking, I think uh, we are in uh, living in very interesting times. And after 1930s, uh, I added uh, some aspects, and I'd like to close here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kitaoka covered uh, international relation, all international relations in the 20th century. So in relation to this overview, uh, Professor Kawashima talked about the history of uh, Japan-China relationship. Thank you. I'm Kawashima. Uh, I'm studying uh, China's diplomacy in uh, modern times and contemporary times. I added critical junctures. A critical juncture is a key word in this project. As Professor Tanaka said, for each region, there's a history of state building. And also, we cover international relations in the 20th century. But in case of China, when we look at the China's uh, modern and contemporary history, what sort of critical junctures can we find? There are a lot of discussions on these. But the Constitution of the People's Republic, uh, 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 People's Republic of China. This is uh, uh, Xinhai uh, Revolution, and also at, and the foundation of the country in 1941. And before that, this is the resistance to invasion and revolution. So these are official. Uh, China's uh, history, and uh, they might add the May 4th uh, event. So those are critical junctures uh, in case of China. But when we look at the ch Chinese history, Chinese historians do not just talk about the, these four critical junctures, about the revolution. There's some suspicion. and. Uh, China became so strong, so we cannot explain the history of China as a resistance to the invasions. So we look at from a different perspective. And one way to look at this is uh, state building, especially when we look at the overall 20th century. This is, uh, we look at the China from nation building or state building in the last 10 or 20 years. This is uh, becoming uh, increasingly a trend. Then uh, the, uh, actually opium war and the 5-4 and Xinhai are kind of uh, go to the background. 900 to 901 actually a boxer rebellion. That's the start. And there's a new policies in the last 10 years of, uh, of nation building, modern nation building. And that is uh, becoming more important. Because when we look at the China for 100 years, they actually uh, nurtured the Chinese language, and they nurtured Chinese, and they created the state. And of course, uh, in 1800, the Qin Dynasty might have been the start, but the sense of being Chinese, uh, they feel strong uh, identity uh, as a Chinese, and that is uh, started in 1900. And one example is there's a Yo Kei Cho, uh, intellectual, at the beginning of 19, he wrote a book on uh, the preface of the Chinese history. And he said, this uh, history of China is not the history of Min or Qin or dynasties the history, but that this is the national history of China. That's what he wanted to write. That's what he said in the preface, but the title uh, he couldn't come up with good title. 
history of the Qin dynasty, then it's a dynasty's uh, history, or Ch- China, uh, China. Uh, but this China is used by foreigns, foreigners. So they he kind of selected the China, history of China, or Chugokshi. But there wasn't that word at that time. So 100 years ago, at the end of the Qin dynasty, Yokeicho and uh, and Shou Henlin actually created the word, coined the word, uh, uh, the history of China, Zhu Gokshi. And uh, that is uh, uh, actually applied to several uh, t- uh, thousand years. Because China has 4,000 uh, history, but actually it's just 100 history when we talk about the history of China. So in the last 100 years, he created a state, built state. And the critical junctures is 1901, uh, Boxer's Rebellion, because the new uh, government tried to create a uh, uh, modern state. So centralized the government. And it tried to actually uh, spread his uh, authority to the uh, agricultural uh, farms. And but in case of uh, Qing, uh, Xinghai, uh, there was a strong central uh, central in 1911. But uh, there was a strong uh, centralization efforts by the government. But 1928 is the establishment of Nanjing. This is one party dictatorship. Song Wen actually went for a Republican uh, system, but uh, this was a one party dictatorship and, and also in 1941, uh, uh, the creation of, uh, of course, there's 1978 and so, 1978 and so on, but the establishment of, uh, uh, People's Republic of China is, of course, one important critical juncture. And when we look at the China-Japan relationship from those critical, based on those critical junctures, that's what I would like to talk. I would be brief. Now, Qing Dynasty, uh, at the end, uh, in 1870s, there's a, a, a treaty of uh, a peace treaty between uh, the Qing and the Japan, Amity a Treaty. And at that time, Qing was uh, stronger, and the Qing had uh, uh, actually dominant uh, position over uh, uh, Japan because the communication between uh, this uh, Japan and the Qing were all in Chinese language, not Japanese language. When you write in Japanese, you have to add the translation in Chinese. So Qing had a, a, a upper hand. And uh, 1886, there was a rioting by the uh, uh, sailors in Nagasaki, uh, by uh, Qing sailors in Nagasaki. This was another example. And of course, uh, Sino-Japanese War is one uh, t- uh, turning point. But when we talk about the relationship between the two countries, we didn't become uh, hostile or b- because uh, the Qing Dynasty had bigger uh, GDP. But then the students uh, from uh, Qing came to Japan and studied because they were more uh, rich, richer than Japan. So, from the Qing's uh, point of view, they stopped the tributary system and they wanted to uh, actually have uh, modern diplomacy. So this triggered a new relationship. But it's not that uh, this war changed everything. There were other factors as well. And after the uh, Boxers' Rebellion, uh, the Qing started to learn about uh, uh, Japan after 1901, so new modern state building was started and a strong nationalism and sense of being Chinese was triggered in those in by 1901 event. And as Professor Kitaoka said from that time, no, at the time of the boxers, uh, Japan sided with the powers and uh, had a war against China. But uh, Japan actually after that uh, 
because there's a Japan Anglo Japanese alliance, but because of the First World War, uh, the Western powers were all engaged in uh, over there. So Japan became actually uh, more pr uh, uh, demanding and became 21 demands. Shantong Peninsula was uh, taken by Japan in Manchuria. Uh, Lushan and uh, Darian were actually occupied. And Russia had the lease, a 25-year lease, from in 1923, after a 25-year lease, in 1923, we had to uh, return the, the concessional lease to China, but uh, it should be changed to 1990, 19, 99, 99 years. So, Actually, China uh, maintained the neutrality in the war, but and the, but the German base was attacked by actually Japan, and Japan occupied most of uh, Shandong Peninsula. So actually, Japan uh, attacked the enemy base uh, in the neutral country, and Manchuria. Uh, was uh, later became part of uh, China, but there's a Taizan, Taishan in um, uh, Shandong. So ever since a long time ago, it has been the central important part of uh, China. So it's a b important. It, so when why Japan is not is not the really uh, liked by China because after nationalism came uh, very became very strong. Japan actually invaded China because there's a uh, MA1 uh, uh, incident, but at that time there wasn't a strong nationalism in China. But when the na when the nationalism was rising, we actually invaded. So the 21st demand was had a strong, a negative impact, and uh, the. Uh, May 7th and May 8th is the uh, uh, memorial of the country's uh, disgrace. I think that was the one important uh, critical juncture. And after that, the so-called Washington system was in place. And the Ch China was uh, actually a war-winning uh, war country. So it succeeded in actually abrogate an equal uh, treaty because it won the war. And also it joined uh, uh, the League of Nations. But from uh, uh, Japan, US, and uh, UK uh, actually cooperated, uh, but it, they didn't actually protect uh, this nine-party treaty was not uh, ratified up by 1925. And uh, actually, a tariff autonomy or tariff uh, autonomy uh, took three years for negotiation. So nine-party treaty and Washington system were not for uh, supporting and protecting the Beijing government. So actually, uh, Guomintang in Guangdong, was, which was outside of this uh, Washington system, played an important role. And because we cannot explain the change uh, in the international relations of China by the Washington system. And the uh, Nanjing government uh, was led, was a nationalist, and Kuomintang created one and ve with very strong sense of nationalism. And the party leads a uh, country. As this model, uh, current model, was created by Kuomintang. And with strong sense of nationalism, uh, it actually uh, obta uh, obtained uh, tariff uh, autonomy and unified the uh, country. But Japan, in from the 1920s to 1931, uh, there was uh, some anti-colonialization issue, but the Nanjing 
government uh, was uh, created and uh, Japan started the uh, Mukden incident. According to uh, Japanese textbooks, they say we were kind of uh, uh, feared about the strong nationalism of China, but the UK is the one who had a strong impact on China. But China kind of maneuvered well, and uh, it actually c returned uh, Ikaye's. Uh, it was rather showed uh, that the, the UK was rather sympathetic to uh, China and uh, it uh, tried to uh, make uh, China look negatively about uh, Japan. And then there's a, a, a Japan-China war, and uh, this Mukden incident is, of course, uh, very important uh, because in Roaming time, uh, Manchuria was invaded by China, so Japan was an invader in the history of China. And it ended in 1933, so I won't take a 15-year war uh, theory, but uh, in between uh, the relationship between Japan and China, this was a critical juncture. And uh, in the extension of that, the 1933 Sino-Japanese War. And uh, because of uh, this uh, Mukden incident and Sino-Japanese War for uh, Republic of uh, China and the Republic, uh, People's Republic of China, uh, this is the uh, foundation of uh, their country, and uh, they w won the war, and so there were a lot of uh, actually propaganda we they used could not uh, be uh, negated because what they talked said to the people they had to actually continue with the tone because uh, they won the war. In case of Japan, they could do it otherwise. So uh, these uh, propaganda during the war had uh, had an important impact on the relationship between the two countries. And uh, China uh, actually became uh, 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 had a chair of uh, UNSC because it was uh, regarded itself as one of the four powers from 1930s to now. So this. Uh, because it is a part of four powers, and it beat Japan and Germany, and that is why their stance after the war was decided by this war that they won. And for Chinese people, when we think of the war after the war, and when we think of the Japanese-Chinese uh, relationship, they, not, they don't start from San Francisco Peace Treaty because they didn't participate in it. Rather, it's a Cairo Declaration that they base. From the Japanese uh, uh, side, of course, the San Francisco Peace Treaty is more important, but the, from uh, China, uh, it's a Cairo Declaration, and this makes a difference between how we look at the history. This is an important point, but I wouldn't touch upon it. But how the war ended? They haven't signed the San Francisco Treaty, Peace Treaty, and uh, uh, April 28, 1952, we ended the war by Peace Treaty of Japan and the ROC. And so there were two uh, Chinese governments. And which one did we recognize and which one did we make uh, a peace? And uh, we actually uh, opted for ROC, and this ended the uh, Sino-Japanese War. Of course, there's a 1972 issue, but uh, this ended the war between the two countries. 52 treaty and uh, it's the 9th of December 1941 and uh, Chiang Kai-shek in, in uh, uh, Chongqing actually started the war. That's the day of the start of the war 
it's not in Japanese textbook, but this treaty has been abrogated. But at that time, that was uh, in the textbook. And then we have to talk about People's Republic of China. And uh, uh, 1901, 1928, 1949, uh, when we look at those three years, 1915 is important. And 1928, uh, the start of the Nanjing uh, government and the recovery of um, uh, authority. And then there's a 49 PRC. Uh, and two governments. And so those important junctures are connected with international relations, and there's a chemical uh, uh, reactions between those. There, are, of course, some people say 1972 is more important. Uh, some, some say 1931 is more important. But it's, imp it's interesting to look at those co combination of international relations and critical junctures. And after uh, it got, went to PRC, I talked about policy and uh, also uh, diplomacy, but Professor Takahara is, is here. So what is the uh, actually turning point uh, in the uh, relationship between China and Japan? And this is the uh, polling. You can actually download it anytime, 1978. But uh, 89 is the uh, turning point. 70% of Japanese uh, felt uh, uh, warm feeling toward uh, China, but the two, 25 uh, actually, uh, there's a, after that, uh, there's a strong feeling of not uh, feeling friendly. So. It seems like uh, 2005 and 1989 are the important uh, uh, turning points. But of course, uh, we can not have this pause from the end of uh, Qin Dynasty, but I would like to end my speech here. Thank you. So at this moment, on these uh, two discussants' uh, remarks. I would like to invite uh, Professor Asano and Professor Takara to talk about uh, their portion uh, and uh, give us uh, comments about uh, the presentations. In the interest of time, I would like to give you five to ten minutes to each person, starting with uh, Professor Asano. Thank you. Professor Kawashima and Professor Kitao uh, gave us a very uh, stimulative uh, talk, and, uh, uh, and times may be changing. That's what I thought. That's about the perspective of a historian. Before, uh, Marxism uh, historical uh, view was uh, valued. We tried to identify facts, and uh, we had to assume uh, positivism. That was emphasized. And young scholars, uh, centering around young scholars, uh, we don't know the significance, but uh, well, there was this incident on uh, this day and that, and that was uh, researched uh, dispassionately. And uh, with uh, today's symposium, I think a uh, macro history or the how to look at history overall uh, is now a major theme that is uh, emerging in front of us. So the two scholars' uh, presentations were well, 100 or 150 year history. How should we look at it entirely? I think uh, the uh, macro perspective was uh, uh, presented to us, and I think uh, uh, all the uh, researchers have to respond to their uh, theme. I think we are in a new era. Now, uh, about uh, nationalism, uh, research Anderson, uh, the uh, uh, community of uh, creati uh, creativity, the printing uh, democracy, and also the uh, bureaucracy, and uh, that uh, creates nationalism, as is often said. But uh, if you look at a single country, that can be that may be true, but uh, in uh, the, uh, there is a conflict in the international relations and also uh, between Sino and Japanese uh, relationship. The, uh, the, in the uh, uh, tension of the uh, two countries, uh, there is a nationalism. So 
nationalism uh, is not uh, uh, emerging from a uh, well uh, two uh, nations history but uh, in the power or the suppressed people the uh, subjugating people started to rise and uh, in uh, relation to others they started to rise so in east asia the nations uh, state building or the state building uh, that uh, can be separated from the uh, international relations and that can be separated from the uh, Sino-Japanese relationship. I think uh, these are the common message from the two uh, discussants. Professor uh, Kitaoka said at the beginning, uh, the, uh, since the uh, 19th century, he uh, presented to us the broad framework, but the territorial uh, border uh, was uh, delineated uh, with the uh, powers uh, well, uh, the uh, erosion of uh, uh, the China in Chinese imperial. There was uh, no border. Uh, the China did not assume any uh, other country assuming the same uh, uh, strength. But then the Western countries came in and they said, this is uh, the French uh, Indochina and this is Russia. So from outside, they delineated the uh, borders and the, the Chinese, uh, the uh, Imperial, well, Imperial China uh, started having borders, national borders, and uh, like uh, in the case of Indonesia, the territory was existent, but uh, the Dutch uh, created uh, uh, the uh, colony of Indonesia. Uh, they started creating the uh, governance and uh, the plantation. Of course, there was uh, economic growth, but uh, with education, the, uh, in, the education was given in European languages and that uh, created the uh, sense of nationalism. And also the e governance uh, uh, structure uh, was established as a, a colonial uh, structure. So in East Asia, in, including Southeast Asia, the Northeast Asia and the Southeast Asia, the, uh, if you look at the modern uh, situation of uh, the East Asia, the Europeans established uh, the uh, uh, governance structure and also economic uh, foundation and uh, including the uh, uh, reaction, uh, the uh, sense of uh, nationalism uh, through education. Uh, these are the starting point of uh, state building, broadly speaking, and uh, that was the first uh, presentation. And on top of it, the anti-imperialism, the uh, U.S. came in, and also the Japanese. Although it's a Japanese uh, Asian country, they occupied Taiwan and also uh, occupied uh, Hong Kong and uh, World War One was the Japan and the U.S., the first uh, Japan-U.S. Uh, war. That's, there was such a nature. And also the European countries uh, had a war and uh, the e colonial rule structure uh, changed at that time in uh, World War I. Uh, I won't uh, repeat what was already said, but uh, I have actually uh, questions. Uh, Professor Kitaoka said the, since the uh, Russo-Japanese war, the Western countries, uh, the, there was uh, the uh, nature of uh, dependency on the Western uh, the uh, debt. In the Japan-France relationship from France, the uh, debt was uh, incurred, and uh, so uh, the uh, Vietnamese students uh, in Japan, they were uh, doing uh, anti-French uh, uh, campaigns, but uh, Japan had to crack down on them. I think this is quite representative, uh, symbolic. I think this is an important issue. I myself, uh, from the perspective of a political uh, diplomatic perspective, I have studied the history of politics. I've been work researching the uh, repression and uh, pre-war uh, debt, it was still remaining. Pre-war debt, uh, it's uh, uh, $500 million. The uh, debt from f France is also here, and also uh, to the UK and US, the pre-war debt is still there. Uh, the uh, Russo-Japanese war and uh, also uh, Korea, uh, the uh, debt uh, from the, uh, well, in uh, that remained until 1952 and the Galio uh, uh, reparation and the pre-war debt and also the uh, compensation, economic uh, uh, assistance happened. And so the although money came from the Western countries and using technology from the Western uh, countries, the uh, occupation was ruled. I think that's the structure. And so there was a dependency on the uh, Western countries, uh, Japan, and uh, 
uh, attempt to change such a Japan uh, was the uh, 21 demands, and uh, including China, uh, the, uh, there was an initiative to establish a uh, uh, East Asian prosperity store. So money was uh, uh, earned in World War One, and using that, China and Japan, uh, the uh, th economic times should be strengthened uh, to uh, move away from uh, dependence on the Western uh, countries. Uh, so the 21 demands was uh, came about because of that, and also after the uh, Mukdang incidents, the creation of Manchur Man Manchukuo, the uh, ties with Russia, uh, not uh, uh, such a China, uh, but uh, the uh, modality of China uh, was attempted. And also uh, from a great depression with the Takahashi uh, finance, uh, Japan uh, went away from the uh, uh, depression, and so such a new deal kind of uh, public works uh, the uh, uh, fiscal investment loan program uh, was the basis for new uh, modern uh, economic policy, uh, like uh, a policy uh, of uh, Chinese uh, well, Japanese uh, uh, imperial state and well. The Western countries, Germany, U.S., uh, they invested in Chiang Kai-shek, and Japanese started investing in the uh, northern uh, China. So in the 1930s, to move away from dependence on the Western countries, non Chiang kai or the uh, Chinese, the, uh, there was an initiative to establish the uh, economic sphere not dependent on the uh, uh, China. Uh, uh, that failed, but uh, uh, it was an uh, uh, imperial state that depended on uh, Western countries, but uh, they wanted to move away. But 21 demands and uh, the uh, was uh, a means for that and the second question and now uh, the the uh, two uh, the uh, national uh, self uh, uh, well uh, determination uh, came about uh, but uh, the international conflict, a peaceful resolution to international conflict uh, based on international law, a peaceful resolution. Uh, that was the mainstay, but uh, there was uh, uh, action uh, opposed to that, and uh, these were the two failures of the national policies. So these two uh, were combined. So what I, my question is, what were possible choices? At which point in time, well, the, uh, when uh, big war became a necessity, and what were the options that were available? Uh, these are rather broad questions. I'm sorry about this, but uh, I am grateful if you, uh, there's an answer to this. And third point, uh, the uh, reconciliation issue. Now, the um, foreign ministry center, the policy is if there is a economic growth, there would be a middle class people and that leads to democrat democracy. And and if a country becomes uh, rich, uh, rich, then uh, nationalism, the anti-Japanese nationalism uh, through exchanges of sports and uh, youth, uh, if the uh, e economic assistance is given for economic growth, then the uh, uh, anti-Japanese sentiment may disappear uh, in, from such a country. So the history and uh, uh, diplomacy should be uh, uh, separated. That's why uh, there should be a joint research of history. But uh, uh, the end result is uh, where we are. And... Uh, uh, if you, well, you can want to separate them, but you can't separate them. So in the Chinese uh, restaurant, there is uh, uh, the, the aggressive Japan, the increasing Japan. Uh, when uh, was it strengthened? Uh, Professor Akawashima uh, talked about it. Uh, once you have this uh, uh, sentiment, uh, sense that uh, Japan uh, is an uh, well invader, uh, how can one possibly remove such a sentiment? Uh, in this symposium, uh, the new uh, historical re uh, framework, how state and nation uh, uh, came about in the international relations. So as a big uh, framework, uh, that, well, in the multi discussion, uh, communicating of this is uh, one attempt that merits uh, attention. Uh, this is just uh, my comment. And uh, state and nation uh, were created artificially with that sense, well, uh, the his China has a history of 4,000 years, but uh, uh, we can't uh, take it for granted, but uh, that's created over the last 100 years. The sense of uh, Japanese-ness uh, uh, came after the uh, end of Ed, uh, Edo era, 
And so by having such a consciousness, uh, there is a possibility of uh, restructuring this, and we can open our eye toward that, and I think that's the purpose of this project. That is my comment. So could you finish your comment? Yes, thank you. Now, going on to Professor Takahara, please. Well, we have heard from the three speakers, but I am not a historian. And so, Professor Kitaoka, Professor Kawashima, they had uh, a wonderful presentation, and therefore, uh, please don't expect me to comment on their wonderful presentation. Like the uh, World Cup uh, team, there are people who you don't expect to be uh, active, but they do. And it's like a rugby player entering a soccer uh, field. So, with regards to my part of this project, I would like to uh, speak along the framework of Professor Kitaka. You have the equilibrium domestically and equilibrium externally, and how is that intertwined? From that perspective, well, uh, the age era is different, but uh, after the Cold War in the 1990s, that is, end of 20th century, is I'd like to use five or seven minutes to talk about the history of those that time. Now, so you have the collapse of the Cold War structure and uh, the uh, disintegration of the USSR uh, influencing Asia too. And uh, I myself am an expert on China. And uh, what is the effect on China? It was quite uh, large. And as you know, well, uh, you must have been around at the time and remember uh, Deng Xiaoping, what did he say? Well, he was uh, in effect the uh, supreme leader. And why uh, did the USSR uh, fail? Well, that is because they could not manage the economy well. That's what he said. And then China itself in 1989 as Professor Kawashima pointed out, there was the 6-4 Tiananmen incident. And uh, the Tiananmen incident, well, Deng Xiaoping, ex in terms of external e equilibrium, well, he was, well, China was pushed into isolation, but he recovered that. And domestically, too, the reform and open door policy, it, he tried to put it back on track and uh, took such external uh, policy. In 1992, there is the planned economy, and uh, they uh, get rid of that. Uh, why is that? Well, the Communist Party of the USSR uh, disappeared, and I think disintegrated. I think that was very big. And uh, the international communist uh, movement uh, would be dropped, as decided by Deng Xiaoping. But, uh, socialist ideology is taken by the country. So if the Soviet uh, communists had uh, continued, then I don't think they could have done anything uh, too uh, bold. Uh, but uh, I think that the big, uh, the fetters uh, were taken away and uh, they could be uh, freer ideologically speaking. And the Chinese Communist Party could uh, be changed in a bold way, their ideology and they tried to ride the wave of globalization. After 1992, the market economy, a big wave came, and then internationally speaking, there was uh, globalization and the development of China. And the development of China and the globalization, there was interaction between the two in the development, and up until today, I think that's the history that we see. And that being the flow of events uh, in 1992, same year, with Korea too, uh, they normalized their ties. And uh, from here, the BRK's, I think, uh, nuclear development uh, begins. That is, uh, the in the international relations of China, economic exchange becomes the most important theme. And I think uh, from this time, we can say that and uh, uh, well, the USSR collapsed, and then for China, the northern threat disappeared so that uh, they could uh, enhance the national power. They could also go 
east and south uh, in terms of the na- uh, the uh, marine maritime affairs too, which is also important. And uh, another thing that I would like to say is in the 1990s, if we remember back to those days in East Asia, regional cooperation, uh, high tide, uh, uh, you could say, arrives. And after the Cold War, um, ASEAN, of course, uh, took the lead. And Japan, too, uh, strongly supports that in regionalism. And this region is uh, deployed. And uh, Japan uh, had uh, uh, well, didn't want to remember the nightmare of the greater co- prosperity sphere. And so in the beginning, the promotion was, uh, you could say, from the uh, backstage, uh, but uh, there was cooperation with Australia in the Pacific and in East Asia, ASEAN took the central role and uh, thereby uh, promoting regional cooperation. And one role was played by the change of the Chinese policy, we can say. That is China. Well, if you exclude the UN, as regards multilateralism, they were not uh, so uh, aggressive. Why is that? Uh, Well, uh, China in the region is a major power up until today. And uh, they, if there is some conflict, they want to uh, have a bilateral resolution because you're the bigger uh, uh, party. And at the time, economically speaking, they were not as big. And so, well, in the region, there's Japan. And if it's Asia Pacific, there's also the US. So you have in the multilateral arena, not uh, necessarily being able to take the leadership, but uh, from the mid 1990s onwards, they changed their policy. And it's a new uh, security I- uh, ideology that they uh, start to adopt. And however, in the country, domestically, uh, in terms of domestic equilibrium, they uh, reinforce uh, this uh, one uh, country um, politics. And uh, well, why did uh, they take this regional policy? The big factor is to avoid isolation and uh, Deng Xiaoping made lots of efforts. Well, not just uh, Deng, Deng, Deng Xiaoping, but Chen Shishin, the famous uh, foreign uh, minister also. Uh, after Tiananmen 6-4, uh, they thought they had uh, recovered from isolation. Then what happened? Well, one thing is the democratization of Taiwan, and uh, Taiwan became democratized so that they have uh, Li uh, Denghui, uh, President uh, Li, trying to broaden uh, the international activity sphere of Taiwan. And then in terms of security between U.S. and Japan, there is a redefining of the uh, U.S.-Japan security structure. And then in 1995, February, uh, there is the mischief reef uh, incident uh, by China in Southeast Asia and South China Sea. Again, uh, confrontation becomes clear. It happened in the 80s and it also happens in the 90s. And uh, somehow, they wanted to prevent uh, isolation coming back and therefore they used this new uh, 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 security ideology and uh, they became more active in the uh, creation of a regional framework and became more bold. And uh, in 1997, there is the Asian financial crisis, uh, which is another uh, major push. uh, That is, globalization is not necessarily uh, bringing about good things. And for the first time, Asian countries realize that. And IMF doesn't help you, Europe doesn't help you, and US doesn't do anything under uh, such a situation, we are in the same boat. Uh, that uh, uh, awareness uh, uh, becomes uh, present, and China was no expe- exception. So you have this kind of trend, and once you enter the 21st century, it starts to stagnate, and uh, national interest becomes uh, more uh, conspicuous. One factor is, especially in 2001, uh, China joins WTO, and it shows uh, even a faster rise. On the other hand, Japan is not growing uh, very much. 
And so China has more national power and they begin to take action and the external equilibrium starts to collapse uh, uh, today. Uh, you could say this is the history behind what we see today. So that is my explanation uh, after the 1990s. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not uh, good at uh, timekeeping. I can't. From the beginning of 20th to 1950s in international relations, and as Professor Takahara said, explain. The Cold War uh, is, uh, I'm in charge of the Cold War period. So what sort of period was the Cold War period? I would like to say just one or two words on it. The Cold War uh, period and the first half of the 20th century simplified. The first half of the 20th century was a multilateral competition period. There were plural numbers of the major power, major uh, countries which competed. Yes, in 1920s there was some com uh, cooperation, but after the Great uh, uh, Depression, uh, there was a competition among the major countries, and sometimes uh, they resorted to military power. But now in the Cold War, multilateral poles uh, disappeared; just two poles remained. And because of two major powers remaining in the 1948, 47 to 1970, middle of the 1970s, uh, the first part of the second part of 20th century, uh, 21st century, it had a, na a major impact on uh, state building and international relations. Because of this confrontation between the two poles, there were proxy wars in Asia. Korean War is one example, Vietnam War is another example. So having two major powers, this became a, a factor for conflicts in Asia. But that's one side of the story. And the second side is, as Professor Kitaoka said, uh, borders which were uh, demarked, uh, marked, uh, delineated in 1900 were protected because of the Cold War. No matter which uh, camp you belong, your country belonged to, if you are uh, the, in the USSR camp or American camp, you are protected by either one or the other. So actually, Cold War helped uh, in maintaining external equilibrium. Japan, by signing a Japan-U.S. security pact, we did not have to have a strong army, but we could maintain a safety and security, and we could maintain external equilibrium. And China, uh, it's a kind of a delicate issue, but when ROC was established, there were two confrontation between the two major countries that helped our uh, nation building and economy of uh, ROC at the early period. And when after the China and USSR conflict, one factor, uh, if you lack a self-control, you cannot maintain uh, ex equilibrium. Uh, Japan's uh, militarism and Mao Zedong's uh, going uh, running amok because they didn't know what to do when the leader uh, actually. Uh, it was uh, true in the uh, uh, Cultural Revolution and the uh, Great uh, Leap Forward. So if there were multilateral poles, what would have happened? When there was a lot of confusion in, uh, inside the country, 1910 to 1920s, uh, that sort of uh, situation might have uh, happened. But at the time of the Cultural Revolution, if uh, 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 the 
the USSR might have attacked China if they want any Cold War. And uh, of course, USSR controlled itself not by not using uh, atomic power, though it kind of declares it. And uh, so, even though Mao Zedong went uh, ran amok, uh, actually, uh, China was pr protected because of this Cold War, and it was uh, now went to Dao Xiaoping's period. So, I think uh, this two pole architecture played an important role. It's a very simple comment. Now, uh, uh, Asano Takahara uh, Tanaka made comments, a response from uh, Professor Kitaoka and Kawashima. Well, I think Asano's comments are most related to what I explained. J Japan Russell War, and there was an enormous uh, debt incurred. And uh, Japan was uh, recognized it was a serious issue. So the second Katsura uh, government, he was prime minister, and he also uh, was a minister of uh, finance because of this uh, enormous debt. But the First World War gave a uh, very good opportunity because Japan became rich. And how to utilize this money it gained? It wasn't uh, used very efficiently, but uh, with UK and uh, France, we refinanced and uh, rescheduled and so on. And there was a Tonzu period of Vietnam, which was, which we could not, Japan could not support because of this relationship between uh, UK and France. That uh, movement did not have that strong, uh, actually, power, just uh, having sympathy. And uh, we had uh, some sympathy felt uh, even before U.S.-Spanish war to the Philippines, but that alone could not help the situation. And the 21 demands. I think that's a result and combination of uh, unfortunate uh, miscalculations. Uh, we, Takaki Kato, foreign minister, felt that the UK is the center of the world. So in 20, 1914, he didn't think uh, that it's going to be a, a great uh, war, a big war. But Kei Hara, understood it. In the future international community, U.S. will play the important role. So we should maintain neutrality because the America maintains neutrality. And if uh, U.S. Uh, joins, then we should follow suit. But Kei Hara said the uh, influence of uh, America, U.S., is uh, strong. Uh, it uh, said so in 42, the 42nd year of Meiji, when he went to uh, the USA. And Korekio Takahashi, who became finance minister under Hara, said, by creating economic sphere, we can uh, cope with the situation. And after the 21st demand, we made a mistake. The Kato's uh, approach was uh, not the really, uh, was really uh, failure. I wouldn't touch upon it because I wrote it. If I had been Kato, I would have done otherwise. In 23, uh, this uh, lease uh, will come, to, uh, will expire. And not many Japanese were aware of it, but the Takaki Kato were aware of it. Uh, there's only 10 more years. But it's not that we have to return uh, this uh, uh, right when this uh, 20, 1923 comes, because we, Japan made a lot of investment, so there's going to be a long-lasting negotiation. And uh, maybe we can say we will uh, lend money, so please extend this uh, lease. So not uh, just uh, try to 
1941, uh, Japan-U.S. Uh, negotiation, of course, uh, if you can actually uh, so, uh, end the negotiation and solve it overnight, it would, have, it would be good. But sometimes it's better to prolong it. In 1914, and uh, we actually attacked the Shandong uh, German base, and we occupied it. But we uh, actually we drew once, we drew once, pull out once. If we uh, Japan could have uh, stayed and uh, occup stayed and keep kept occupying it, and then if negotiation goes well, then we could have withdrawn. Then the Shanton uh, issue could have been solved. So strategically and tactically, there were a lot of uh, mistakes Japan made. Now going back to economy. Well, economy centric uh, approach was of course important, but. There was a crash after the Great Depression, and one important uh, thing was gold standards. That was the uh, because many countries wanted to go back to the uh, gold standard, and the party at that time was also. But Tanzan Ishibashi, who was a journalist, and uh, of course Kyo. Kyo Takahashi were actually the only one who did not want to go back to uh, the gold standard. Actually, this is uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, financial theory or financial idea. But even if we wanted to go back to the gold standard, uh, you have to uh, actually uh, devalue the yen uh, because of the economic power of that of Japan at that time. And I think uh, Professor Mitani did not touch upon it. Why not devaluation and go back to concerted diplomacy or I international cooperation? I have a, a, a question mark about this. And the uh, Professor Kawashima touched upon. The UK withdrew a bit by bit. But Japan never tried to withdraw uh, uh, itself, it, if it expands, it remains there. Taro Katsura, who became a finance minister, and uh, he said that he should, we should, uh, Japan should uh, advance to the south, not uh, just uh, insist on Manchuria. And after the First World War, there's a closer relationship with Southeast Asia, and economic ties became strong. But in 1930s. There was a problem with the U.S. and there was a lack of uh, oil and that uh, we could not have good foresight about uh, being prepared for that sort of situation. But reparation after the war, we actually paid back to the USA. Shigeru Yosta said uh, that was inevitable. We had to uh, repay and first to the USA. Reparation will come later. Be because if we repay uh, the money to the USA, they will lend it again. But uh, if we rep uh, provide the repatriation to Southeast Asia, it will not uh, come back to us. Uh, so Shigeru Yoshida said that he was uh, confident about that view. Thank you. Uh, since we are talking about history of international relations, what was the debate in Japan uh, uh, looking at uh, China and other countries? Now, 21 demands and uh, 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 the uh, uh, bilateral relations uh, logic was quite different. With the uh, de 21 demands in China, there was a an strong anti-Japanese sentiment. And then Sega died, and after that, Dan Kizui, uh, how to involve him. Uh, well, uh, then uh, the debt issue arose, and uh, using Japanese taxpayers' money, the uh, debt was not uh, repaid, so it was enormous. Dan Kizui uh, used his own military, went to Mongolia and Siberia. China uh, sent uh, soldiers to uh, uh, Siberia, and the money was used for that. And about uh, 21 demands, Ensegai's uh, demand was Shantong and Manchuria. Uh, we had to live with it. In, in other words, uh, we had to wait until the war ended. After the war ends, uh, we should involve uh, our great powers. Uh, it was a strong country. Uh, so we uh, should uh, pull it out and uh, wait for the end of the war. That was the strategy. 
And as uh, Professor Kitaoka says, the number five issue, as for number five, China, what was in thinking? Kataki Tako in the 1900s, uh, this was uh, used for the Manchuria issue. This was a threat. So, uh, so the number five, there was no mention, uh, there was no negotiation. So that was the stance. So 21 demands at the end of the when it was 24, uh, there was an increase, and then uh, China accepted it uh, at long last. So importance is uh, 21 demands. Uh, the uh, in China uh, the treaty, the word treaty used. So that was uh, imposed by Japan. That was a uh, quite aggressive, uh, unequal uh, treaty. So there was a demand. It wasn't a treaty. It was just a demand. Anyway, uh, Professor Tanaka or Professor Takashi said. Well, well, sorry, and so uh, the uh, reconciliation. As for reconciliation, the, in, in there's a negative image in Japan. What to do with it? Unfortunately, uh, we are aggressor. Uh, so aggressive country, well, of course, uh, there's a public uh, diplomacy. This is important, but uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, the reconciliation, so uh, Japan is, we have to recognize the facts. We have to uh, reflect on the facts. Uh, we have to criticize ourselves. So the uh, national propaganda in the counterparty that's not pleasing. It's a negative factor for reconciliation. But uh, what to do with it? Uh, I don't know what can be said. But anyway, the I love uh, anti-Japanese drama. I love them. No, well, I watch them uh, many, many uh, things. But uh, it, there's a good trend. Japanese people appear in them, and uh, the Japanese have names. In the past, they were just uh, demons, but uh, these days they are called Mr. Kato and so on. And they have different natures. And uh, the uh, military uh, police, and uh, there's a fight. So I think that's a great progress. Uh, it's very interesting uh, and uh, fun to observe them. So you have to uh, closely look at uh, your counterparty. And, uh, well, I learned a great deal from Professor Takas' comment. Well, I thought that in 1990s uh, there was a change in China, North Korea, Vietnam, uh, the uh, socialist country, uh, how uh, they positioned the relationship with uh, Vietnam and North Korea. After that, Beijing, Pyongyang, Be uh, Beijing, uh, Hanoi, uh, there was a uh, instability and also Russia uh, the uh, China Russia uh, relationship was delicate so in after 1990s China uh, how uh, did they redefine Russia there was no weight but uh, how did they, they uh, position Russia uh, I got very interested in it thank you professor Tanaka's uh, remarks well the uh, uh, Chinese revolution and the great brief forward, uh, well, it was a not a two. Uh, what was, uh, what would have been the situation if there was a Marta? It's in 1966 when the Cultural Revolution started. Chiang Kai-shek uh, thought it was a great opportunity. Now was the time uh, to get back uh, Aseko and go back to uh, Nanjing. But uh, it was stopped by someone, the U.S. No matter what, uh, it shouldn't happen. So the U.S. The, uh, had to protect uh, the uh, uh, Taiwan Strait. Only protection, not aggression. So Chiang Kai-shek uh, lamented. Well, uh, well, sorry for Taiwanese, but uh, the U.S. imperialism uh, kept uh, myself in the small island of Taiwan. Chiang Kai-shek, what did he want to say? Uh, surprisingly, uh, Russia. Chiang Kai-shek uh, was tied with uh, USSR, Tagebe, and uh, Chiang Kai-shek wanted to join hands with the uh, USSR to attack uh, uh, Fujian province. Uh, Kusigun, uh well, went to uh, Beijing. But uh, if UK, France, if there was a multilateral relationship, Chiang Kai-shek would have done many things, like uh, 20s, 30s, uh, he approached uh, uh, Germany and so on. Uh, the same would have been done by Chiang Kai-shek. So there were only two. So greatly poured uh, cultural revolution. Uh, they didn't uh, lead to uh, war, and this is quite insightful. And uh, uh, this uh, is in line with the historical facts, and Chiang Kai-shek uh, would have been convinced listening to their stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now uh, we have run out of time. I am very sorry. Uh, we don't have any time to receive questions from the floor. But uh, having said that, uh, I would uh, like to say a few things uh, in one or two minutes. Now, Professor Asano said, well, as for the Japanese history, what was wrong? Uh, as many people say, well, uh, this was wrong. Uh, it is true. But uh, 
uh, from the perspective of uh, a comparative history like this project, from the historical history, uh, comparative history perspective, this is not much done for Japanese history, the modern Japanese state. How strong was it? How fragile was it? I think it would be interesting if you analyze this theme. In other words, what was not possible, what was not done, is the policy makers uh, had a, a poor capability as an individual. Is, was that the case? Or pre-war uh, Japan, Japanese state, even though you are an able person, you weren't able to do things. So in other words, well, the uh, internal equilibrium the, uh, within the government, the control structure was fragile, particularly the military uh, went out of control. Uh, how would you be able to control it? Uh, it was beyond the individual's capability, and uh, the structure uh, of the state was such nothing could have been done. I think that was one aspect to the pre-war Japan. Well, uh, the, I am not uh, trying to excuse the Japanese policymakers, but uh, in the past, uh, uh, Masao Maruaka Ma, uh, said that there was no head in Japan. Uh, positively speaking, it was not uh, correct, perhaps, but uh, the, when you look at the Japanese history uh, uh, as a history of uh, the administration of Japan, I think that's a, a pertinent issue that uh, may uh, merit our attention. So this is just my comment, and so that concludes the morning session. Thank you. So with this, we would like to bring the uh, part one, East Asia and International Relations in the 21st Century, to an end. In the afternoon, uh, part two, the state and region building uh, in East Asia, the examples of South Korea, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, will start at 1 p.m. And uh, the uh, discussants, we have uh, lunch for you. So we'll start at 11.50. Please go up to the first floor. On the other side of the lobby, you go uh, down to the uh, basement one floor, Sakura restaurant.